afternoon everyone um, I'm recording today in our prayer room at Bethel Community Church after having some nice time at the fellowship with the Lord today um, I can't make up my mind really what today um, I thought I might follow on with what we did yesterday and just finish that chapter uh, Hebrews chapter 11 uh, 12 Let's have a look at that. Yeah, we'll do that. And we'll see what time we've got left then. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, 12. Yesterday we read to verse 14, uh, verse 13. But we'll start again on verse 12 today. I think that's good to go. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for thy feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Warnings against refusing to listen. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, because he, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Hmm. For, as my, for you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor with blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they have that heard in, entreated, that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Verse 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall we not shall much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he had promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word you once more signified the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, and those things which cannot be shaken may, be, may remain. Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that you will bless us now as we study this passage of scripture. I pray that you will open the word up to us, Lord, that we will receive some, some instruction, some blessing. And if we need correction in any area of our lives, Lord, you will humble us. Lord, because our desire is for us to be humbled, Lord, and you to be exalted, Lord. I just pray, Lord, for those who tune in today, those who are watchmen on the wall, the Lord who have to give the warning messages out to people, that, Lord, you would speak to them, you would protect them, and you would lead them, and you would guide them in all truth. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, let's just briefly discuss what we read the last bit yesterday. In chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, the word whereof, or so, is a clue that what follows is important. 
we must not live with only our own survival in mind. Others will follow our example and we have a responsibility to them if we claim to live for Christ. Does your example make it easier for others to believe and follow and mature in Christ? Does our example encourage other people to follow Christ or does it turn them away from Christ? That's something we need to look at in our own lives and ask God if that's true. Does your example make it easier for people, others to believe, follow and mature in Christ? Or would those who follow you end up confused and misled? Do you say one thing and you mean another? Do you say one thing and your actions show something else? That's what we can ask God to deal with within us. Verse 14. The readers of this were familiar with a ceremonial cleansing ritual that prepared them for worship and they knew they had to be had to be holy or clean in order into, to enter into the temple. Sin always blocks our vision of God. So if we want to see God, we must remove it from our lives. Let's look at Psalm 24. Psalm 24. And Psalm 24 and verses 3 and 4. He restores my soul. He leads, no, 24, verse 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. You know, are we in that place with God? Are we humble before him? Are we searching him? Are we seeking him? Are we washing our hands clean? Are we keep not figuratively that speaking? Are we keeping our heart and our lives pure before God? Oh God, help us, Lord, to be humble before you. Holiness is coupled with living in peace. A right relationship with God leads to right relationships with fellow believers. Although we will not always feel love towards all other believers, we must pursue peace as we become more Christ-like. And verse, let's look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, Look, Indiligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby may be defiled. Like a small root that grows into a tree, bitterness springs up in our hearts and overshadows even our deepest Christian relationships. Bitterness comes when we allow disappointment to grow into resentment, or when we nurse grudges over past hurts. Bitterness brings with it jealousy, dissension, you know, arguments, confusion, rebellion and immoral immorality. When the Holy Spirit fills our lives, however, he can heal the hurts that causes bitterness. bitterness. Have you got any bitterness in your heart against any man, brother or sister, or against God even? Then we need to come to him in repentance and root, take that root out. You know, we must destroy the root. That's just made me think of Japanese knotweed. You know, the knotweed. Uh, you know, if you don't kill the root, then it's going to spread and continue to grow. And even when you dig out the root, you have to burn it. Because even the smallest little bit of root can grow into a great forest of Japanese knotweed and take over and undermine buildings and other things. So we need to make sure that we have no root of bitterness in us, that we come before God in true repentance and true holiness. Bitterness comes when we allow disappointments to grow into resentment or we nurse grudges over past hurts. Bitterness brings with it jealousy, dissensions and immorality. That turns us away from God and leads us into sin. When the Holy Spirit fills our lives, however, he can heal the hurt that causes bitterness. Verse 16 and verse 17, we look at Esau's story. Shows us that mistakes and sins come, 
sometimes have lasting consequences. Yeah? When we do something wrong, there is always consequences. God may forgive us if we truly repent, but there are still consequences to our actions in the long term. Let's have a look at Genesis chapter 5. Uh, Genesis 25, sorry. Genesis 25, and let's read about Esau. Jacob and Esau. Genesis chapter 25. And let's read from Genesis 25, verse 29 to 34. 29 to 34. Let's have a look. Where are we? And Jacob sawed pottage. He made, he made pottage. And Esau came from the field, and he was faint. He made a, made food, he made like a stew, I should imagine. And Esau, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint, because he'd been hunting. Esau was a hunter. And he was exhausted and tired. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that red pottage. So it could have had lentils in it. Often that's, you know, what makes it red, red lentils. For I am faint, therefore was his name called Eda, because he said, I am faint. How many verses was we going to read there? 29 to 34. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point of today, and what profit shall this birthright do me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he spake unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. I love it. That was right then. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. But Esau despised his birthright. Esau traded the lasting benefits of his birthright for immediate pleasure. And often we can do that. We can... Sell our souls to the devil, as I've heard that saying, where people have done that, and then the devil tries to take back what is his. Well, we can sell our souls for evil things, or things that we want, our lusts of our flesh, and our mind, and we can give in to temptation, and then we sell our birthright. You know, our birthright is that which God has given us, our right to standing with God, our right to be able to go to heaven with him. But if we turn away from our sins and we do not repent, then God, we will lose our rights. God wants us to be faithful and obedient to him in everything, to put God first in everything in our lives. He acted on impulse, satisfying his immediate desires with, without pausing to consider the long-range consequences of what he was about to do. We can fall into the same trap. When we see something we want, our first impulse is to get it. Yep, we got to be careful because sometimes our first impulse is not always the right impulse. Sometimes we think, oh, something is right. And sometimes we haven't even prayed about it and asked God first, is this the right way? Is this what I should be doing? Or do we go off on our own tangent and do something? But there's always consequences to going off God's track. When we see something we want, our first impulse is to get it. At first, we feel intensely satisfied and sometimes even powerful because we have obtained what we set out to get. But immediate pleasure often loses sight of the future. We can avoid making Esau's mistake by comparing the short-term satisfaction with its long-range consequences before we act. Esau exaggerated his hunger. I am at the point today. How often do we exaggerate things? We all do it and we all have to repent of it. It's like lying to making things to be bigger than they really are sometimes. He said this thinking this made his choice much easier. But if he was starving, what good was an inheritance anyway? The desire of the moment distorted his perspective and made his decision seem urgent. 
we may have similar experiences. For example, when we feel sexual pressure, a marriage license may seem unimportant. Nothing else seems to matter. But we lose our perspective. Getting through that short pressure-filled moment is often the hardest part of overcoming temptation. So we should not be like Esau and just try to satisfy our immediate need without thinking about the consequences in the future of that. And also in chapter 27 of Genesis, let's go back, I, I shouldn't have closed it there, should I? Chapter 27 gives another example of how he gave up his birthright. And verse 36, 27 and verse 36. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? See, God, um, Isaac was dying. And he was very old and he was blind and he was deceived by Jacob and his mother to receive the blessing before he died. He pretended that he was Esau. And, you know, we can pretend things so we get what we want, but we need to be careful and obedient to the voice of God. Even repentance and forgiveness do not, do not always eliminate sin's consequences. First we see something, then we have a thought and it develops and we go along with it rather than saying, God, what is your decision in this? What should I really be doing right at this point in time and everything? Should I go along with these sinful desires or should I obey what you are saying to me? How often do you make decisions based on what you want now? Good question. Rather than on what you need long term, evaluate the long range effects of your decisions and actions. We must always do that. Prayerfully come to God when we're tempted by something or we have a good thought and, and we need to check it out with God and so seek him to make sure the decision we're about to make is the right one. Because if it's the wrong one, there are always consequences. There are always consequences to obedience as well. Like when we obey, we get the blessing. But when we disobey, we get the curses and the, the, the terrible stuff that comes along with disobedience. Evaluate the long-range effects of your decisions and actions. Let's look at it, verse 18. We're back now in 12 of Hebrews 12. Verse 18 to 24. What a contrast between the people's terrified approach to God at Mount Sinai and their approach to Mount Zion. What a difference Jesus made. Jesus came. They were afraid to go near the mountain when Moses went up in the wilderness because they'd been warned they would be destroyed or they would be killed or they would be stoned if they touched the mountain. But now, since Jesus came to forgive us of all of our sins, we can approach God. We can approach and go into his presence, holy and perfect before him. What a difference Jesus made. Before he came, God, God seemed distant and threatening. After he came, God welcomes us through Christ into his presence. If you read in Hebrews, it talks about Jesus becoming a high priest and going into God's presence and making the way possible for us to go in. Before, there was often a barrier or a curtain that went into the Holy of Holy's presence. But when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain was rent apart. It was torn from top to bottom. That shows that God's hand was in it. You know, if you rip from bottom up, you know, a man's hand was in it. But anyway, let's carry on with this, you know. So let's make sure that we are following and obeying and doing everything in obedience to God. Now, because Jesus has made a way that we can go into God's presence. 
Don't neglect to accept the invitation at now. Let's read that bit about it. God seemed distant and threatening. After he came, God welcomes us through Christ into his presence. Don't neglect to accept the invitation. God now invites us to come in. He wants us to come into his presence. He wants us to develop that relationship and right standing before him. He wants us to come before him with humble, broken hearts that we might be lifted up into his will and purpose for our lives. And then in verse 22 of chapter 12, Christians are partakers in the heavenly Jerusalem. Right now, we can experience God's kingdom and his power here on earth. Because Christians are partakers in the heavenly Jerusalem right now because Christ rules in our lives. The Holy Spirit is always with us and we experience sweet fellowship with other believers. The full and ultimate rewards and reality of the heavenly Jerusalem are depicted in Revelation 21. Well, we've studied that, but if you'd like to go and read Revelations 21, because of time, we won't do that right now. Then in verse 27 to 29 of chapter 12 of Hebrews, eventually the world will crumble and only God's kingdom will last. Those who follow Christ are part of his kingdom and they will understand the shaking, sifting and burning. Yes, God allows us to go through that shaking, building and sifting. God works in our lives and we should be open to that sifting, that changing, that, that transforming power of God in our lives. We need his power. We should be walking faithfully before him and this is what God wants us to be doing. So if at some point you have fallen away, God wants to bring you back and he wants to change you, he wants to shake you, he wants to sift you, he wants to burn up anything that is not of him that's in your life. Oh God, help us. When we feel unsure about the future, like we do at the moment, there are so many things, prophecies coming to pass on a daily basis, and we feel unsure about the future, we can take confidence from these verses. Whatever happens here, our future is built on a solid foundation that cannot be destroyed. Don't put your confidence in that which we will, will be destroyed. Like Jesus says, don't put your trust in man. Don't put your, tr your confidence in princes, in dual wealth or prosperity or homes or cars or anything else. But put your full confidence in Jesus Christ. Because that's the only thing that cannot be destroyed. Everything else can be destroyed. Don't put your confidence in that which will be destroyed. Instead, build your life on Christ and his unshakable kingdom. Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. It's good if you can follow these as I'm giving the message. So write them down and read them again yourself after. Please make sure that when you hear anything I say that you check it out. You test it and you make sure that what I'm saying is correct. Matthew 7 verse 24 to 29. Leave there, there any gift before... Oh no. Is that right? No, Matthew 7. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. Well, this is still part of it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 29. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. Who's, who you was? Who? Let's get my words out. 
Who are you building your life on? Material gain, wealth, prosperity, uh, people pleasing or other things? Or are you building your life totally on the rock, on Christ Jesus? Let's read on. And verse 26 of Matthew 7. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus has ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So we need to make sure what we build in our lives upon, so that we might faithfully obey God, Verse 28, we come into the end now, the last part of the chapter of Hebrews 12, verse 28 says, Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Here are five ways we can be thankful. We can be thankful that God answers our prayers. Read Isaiah 65, 24 and John 11, verse 41. Two, we can be thankful for God's provision for our needs. First Thessalonians 5, verse 17 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. And verse 18, verse Tim, uh, first Timothy 4, verse 4 and 5 is another example of that. Three, we can be thankful for God's blessings. First Chronicles 16, verse 34. I wonder, I'm not going to go into it, but I think that's about us being faithful to God. And if we are, he will pour out blessings upon us. But there's also curses if we do not obey him. Let's go on. And um, let's have a look. Where were we? Thankful for God's blessings, yeah, Philippians 4 verse 6. And then 4, we can be thankful for God's character and wonderful works. Psalm 7, 17, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15, and Revelations 11 and verse 7. 5, we can be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, and Ephesians 1 16, and Philippians chapter 1 Verse 3 to 5. Okay, my brothers and sisters, there's an awful lot in that, even those short verses that we can study. So please, if you didn't get all those scripture references done, please rewind this and listen to it again. And if you enjoyed this broadcast, please like and share it with your friends and friends and family. And uh, subscribe to this channel so the more people will hear the word of God. Well, let us pray. Lord, I thank you that we've been able to look into your word. Help us not to be like Esau and run ahead into doing things that our flesh and our mind and heart, which is sinful, would rather do and get satisfaction sexually, emotionally, whatever it might be. Lord, I'm making decisions without coming before you and asking you first. God, is this what you want me to do? So, Lord, I pray that even after this message, we would turn to you. And, Lord, if we have been walking in a sin or unbelief, or, oh Lord, we've been satisfying the sinful lusts of our flesh and not the, sin, not the godly, holy desires of you. Lord, help us to turn to you. Lord, I pray for everyone who hears this broadcast that, Lord, you will challenge us, Lord, to become more like you, to seek you in all things, to put God first and Jesus first in everything, in everything we decide to do. If we plan in our day ahead, put God first, ask God for his direction and guidance at the beginning of the day and help us to learn to thank him at the end of the day. Lord, help us to be in obedience in preaching your word and proclaiming your love and your gospel of good news to those around us. I pray, Lord, that we will not be afraid of what men will say. We will not people please. We will do what God tells us to do. And Lord, all you're asking for us is our humble obedience. 
Lord, because all the blessings in the book are mine, if I put my trust in you, and if I obediently walk with you. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you warned us that we would experience trials and temptations, but Lord, you would not let us to go through anything that we cannot do, Lord, but that we can turn to you in every circumstance, and we can know you, and we can know your heart of true repentance. Now, I thank you for this message now, Lord, that you have been with us, you've spoken to us. It's your words, not my words. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue over the weeks and months, Lord, I'm going to have to continue this. I didn't intend to do this at the beginning. But, Lord, I feel your guidance and I feel Lord's hand saying that we must do that. As a watchman, as you called me to be a watchman as a child, Lord, Lord, I accept the responsibility I know many people will not like the message that we preach, but we must preach Christ crucified and Christ alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Be with us, Lord, those who hear the message, those who obey the message that you've given us today. Help me to faithfully obey your word and do as you've asked me to do. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>